Hey everybody, I bought a used telescope with low expectations, and then I broke it, and then I found out it was pretty cool. Oh, sweet. <laughs> and then I attached the camera to see what it could do. My name is Chris, and welcome to my channel. So this telescope is the Celestron Nexstar 102 GT. Uh, I've learned that this is a telescope that's sold only at Costco for a limited time, but it came incredibly cheap at 200 US dollars. For 200 dollars, you got a 4 inch aperture, 1000 millimeter focal length, achromatic refractor. Now I know what you're thinking, achromatic refractor. But on doing some research, what I found was that this scope was actually very well liked because the 1000 millimeter focal length offset a lot of the chromatic aberration that you normally see. Now within that price, you also get the Nexstar GT mount, which is very similar in specifications to the SLT mount. In fact, in all of my research, I haven't really been able to find too much of a difference between the two mounts, other than that the SLT has a power switch, whereas the GT mount is basically plug in and go. Both mounts profess to have 40,000 celestial objects in their data banks, same as the SE mounts. Both claim to have go-to functionality. Both operate in Alt-AZ as well as EQ North or EQ South modes, meaning in theory they should be able to support a wedge. In fact, a quick search on Cloudy Nights shows a number of different people posting that they have tried to attach an SLT mount to a wedge. I read online that the mount itself had very little torsion, and I did find that the scope moved very easily up and down. But I also saw a blog where you could tighten the retaining bolt, which would tighten the clutch, thereby making the telescope stiffer to move up and down. The tripod that the mount comes with is uh, less than sturdy, and it comes with this uh, sort of bucket that the mount fits into and bolts it from the bottom using a quarter inch bolt, similar to a typical DSLR mount. Now, on tightening one of the legs, uh, the plastic clamp immediately broke. Now, this was tragically similar to what happened with my SE mount. If you've seen my previous video about the solar eclipse, you would have seen that the leg on my SE mount snapped as I was trying to secure the mount when setting up the scope. Now, I did order a replacement leg, which I don't think through any fault of Celestron's came out very expensive. I paid three times for what the leg was worth, once for the leg, once for shipping, and almost as much again for duties shipping from the US to Canada. What I used this time to fix the leg was a hose clamp. So a very basic uh, screw type hose clamp uh, in which I cut out a section so that I could put the bolt through and then tighten that around the leg, which forced the clamp to close and actually secured the leg fairly well. Another thing I immediately changed about the uh, tripod is that the feet were plastic. It didn't come with a little rubber tip that comes with other Celestron mounts. So I did what I did with my SE mount when the rubber tips wore off, which is I cut down some walking stick tips and used those on each of the three legs. I did notice, however, that the controller had a USB output at the bottom same as the SE mount. So just for kicks, I plugged in my laptop and brought up CPWI. And I was really surprised that it worked. CPWI recognized the mount as a Nexstar GT and it was able to control it.
When I went to do my alignment in Alt-Z mode, I had forgotten that Alt-Z alignment actually needs you to put the telescope facing north, not south, as you do with a wedge. So I had to shift the telescope around after I had connected everything. Now I've seen somewhere that this telescope weighs about six and a half pounds, and the Nexstar GT mount has a weight capacity of eight pounds. Between the camera and the additional weight, I'm pretty sure I blew that by another five or six pounds total. But the mount was still responsive enough in the end, and didn't suffer too much for being overloaded. The moon was pretty full this night, and I decided that the first target I should align on should be the moon, as it would be the easiest to find. Sure enough, the moon came up right away. After picking the moon as my first alignment object, I went to the nebula, and here I had to use the red dot finder to find the star, which in the end was also fairly easy to do. That took a little bit longer than I thought it would, but uh, I was able to connect both the Nexstar GT mount as well as uh, the Nikon camera before I head upstairs and uh, play with some imaging. I'm gonna go back to the moon. I'm gonna try to play a little bit with the focus to get the moon in focus. Uh, and then, uh, well, I'll try doing some imaging and we'll see what we get. The focus knobs on the telescope were fairly big and easy to use, so I didn't really have any problems focusing. Now, I should say that I did not use a Batonov mask. However, even with manual focus and eyeballing the focus of the stars and the features of the moon, I think my focus was pretty good. I ended up imaging the moon for a little bit. Um, now, from experience, when using backyard Nikon, like I'm doing in this case, Backyard Nikon uses live view to capture video feed from the DSLR camera itself. Now the live feed in the camera is very low resolution. So instead what I did was I uh, just took very many short exposure images in the highest resolution that the, ca that the camera was capable of. Uh, and then I used those to stack later on. Once I was done with the moon, I slewed over to the first target that I actually wanted to test with. And this was a Galaxy NGC 4565, the Needle Galaxy. Same one I had imaged recently with the 6SE using the UV IR cut filter. So this time I was shooting with a nearly full moon, unfiltered with a Nexstar 102 GT. The second object I wanted to image was Markarian's chain. With the 102 GT, I was getting a wider field of view so I was hoping to see a little bit more of the chain than I could with the 6SE. I had just finished imaging Markarian's chain, and in fact the entire Virgo cluster, or most of it, with the Rokinon, in what I think turned out to be one of my most interesting images. And I was curious to see how this scope would do. And the final object I wanted to test the scope out with was a globular cluster. So in this case, I picked M12. This is a cluster that I haven't imaged in a long time. In fact, I think my last image was from a few years ago when I was still using the Nikon without any filters. Now I'm going to state the obvious here. I'm imaging in Alt-AZ mode using 15 second exposures without any kind of wedge. The images that I'm taking are over a short duration in order to minimize field rotation. So this is not a deep sky astrophotography setup. This is the kind of setup that you would expect for electronically assisted astronomy, or if you're really curious about imaging and you're just starting out. Once finished, I processed the images. I used AstroStackert on the moon, where I used the top 25% of the pictures that I took, which amounted to 50 images that went into the stack. I curve adjusted the image in Cyril, and then I did some additional sharpening and contrast in GIMP. For the Needle Galaxy, I stacked the images using Deep Sky Stacker before adjusting the curves and removing the background in Cyril and doing some additional post-processing in GIMP. Now what's interesting here is I've imaged this galaxy a number of times throughout the years. 
And here we have a series of three images, the one in the center, which was using the Nikon camera a number of years ago with the 6SE telescope using short exposure, similar to what I just did today with the 102 GT. The top left hand corner is the processed image from the 102 GT, which looks pretty good in comparison to my early captures from the 6SE. And the one on the right is a capture from last year with the Celestron 6 inch. And finally here on the right we have a comparison of my most recent image of the Needle Galaxy. This was shot with a UV IR cut filter and guiding using the Celestron 6 SE. This is not a fair comparison. The image on the right represents a filtered view over many hours, whereas the image on the left is 82 frames at 15 seconds apiece, unfiltered from a 4 inch achromatic refractor. However, the fact that you can make out the galaxy at all surprises me, as this is a magnitude 10 celestial object. Here's a comparison of the 102 GT's image capture performance on the right on Markarian's chain. You can see in the bottom of the image from the 102 GT, which is the image on the right in case you're wondering, that uh, there is some unevenness in the stack, that there are some images that just didn't quite overlap in terms of frames. And the reason for this is that the telescope was hitting the mount as it was trying to track Markarian's chain in the sky, which brings about one of the biggest issues with this telescope. It is a very long telescope, and to look at anything up in the sky, you're going to start hitting the mount. In fact, in order to look straight up, you often have to reposition the mount in order to get around the legs, which means having to redo your alignment. So if you're using this telescope in Alt-AZ mode, I think you're just going to have to accept the fact that there's some objects you're not going to be able to slew to. And finally, here's an image of M12. Now, for M12, I was only able to get about seven minutes worth of integration time, which, interesting enough, is the same amount of integration time I had on M12 when I imaged it last with the Nikon and the Solstron 6SE. So this is probably the best side-by-side -side comparison of all of the images I've taken. Both of these images were shot with an unmodified Nikon without filters using the separate respective telescopes, except the image on the left was imaged on a wedge without guiding, while the image on the right was used in Alt-AZ mode. The clarity and resolution of the image on the right is better than I expected. One thing I've noticed in all of these images is that uh, there is a tint to the beige. So everything is beigey and yellow in the background. And the stars lack color. In fact, all of the stars come out as bluish. This isn't something that I noticed when I was visually viewing through the telescope. But pushing it this far through imaging, I think, brings out these discolorations. So not that I would, but if I were to image with the scope, I would probably stick to mono or convert my images to black and white, desaturating them as much as possible. Imaging with this telescope was a fun little experiment, but I'm really excited about using this thing for visual. Not that I have a lot of experience with visual observing, but I actually found looking through this telescope to be fairly enjoyable, easily as much so as with the Solistron Skymaster 15 by 70 binoculars. In fact, the view through the binoculars was very similar to that through the telescope, except the telescope has a go-to mount, which for someone who doesn't know the sky as well as I should, is actually a feature. Speaking of visual, here's some video I took with my iPhone using a 2x Barlow and an 11mm eyepiece. Besides visual, I had one ulterior motive to buying this used telescope, and that was to see whether or not the mount could be used in equatorial mode as a cheap alternative to a star tracker. So if you're interested, look for that video coming soon. Until next time, thanks for watching and clear skies.